Hello and welcome. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for the first in a series of four CMEO snacks titled Too Much Sleep, Quality of Life in Patients with Idiopathic Hypersomnia. This CMEO snack series is supported by an independent medical education grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals. I'm Dr. Richard Bogan, Associate Clinical Professor at the University of South Carolina Medical School in Columbia, South Carolina, Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina, and Principal of Bogan Sleep Consultants, LLC in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm very pleased to be joined today by a distinguished colleague and expert, Dr. Anne Marie Morse. Thank you so much for having me today, and I'm excited to be able to discuss. My name is Anne Marie Morse, and I'm an associate professor at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. I also am the director of the Child Urology and Pediatric Sleep Medicine Program at Geisinger Janet Weiss Children's Hospital in Danville, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Anne Marie. To frame the discussion today, let me review our learning objective. Our goal is that after this CME snack, you'll be able to characterize the impact of IH and his symptoms on the quality of life and functioning of patients and their families. So let's start off our program by looking at what patients may be reporting to you in your patient visits. Oftentimes, their descriptions can be indicative of idiopathic hypersomnia. Let's look at some descriptions that were given by real patients with IH and how they translate to symptoms specific to IH. Dr. Morse, could you discuss these? Sure. So I think it's really interesting, and even some of the word selection that the patients were represented by this picture are demonstrating. So very frequently when we're thinking about sleep in the medical community, we sometimes will refer to the work by like Clifford Safer out of Harvard, where he describes sleep and wake relationship as a flip-flop switch. And here we have Shelly describing, I can't turn my sleep switch off. She's 100% correct. Mm -hmm. People who have idiopathic hypersomnia frequently describe their excessive daytime sleepiness by, be, by this overwhelming feeling of always wanting to have more sleep, no matter what they get. It's almost an insatiable need for sleep. There also is this feeling of that there is not a period of time where they can feel refreshed, which sometimes is a distinguishing factor from patients who have narcolepsy, where they will sometimes describe, a person with narcolepsy will describe, I take a nap and there's this temporary cessation of, I feel normal. I feel as though I don't have a sleep disorder. There are also are other symptoms that seem to be even greater than the excessive daytime sleepiness, such as brain fog or cognitive impairment, where Robin describes here that she feels as though that normal, typical functioning is a task. Being able to engage, to process, to remember, it's taking so much more work. And still, when she's trying at her best, it is difficult to do the same as what she's seeing her peers do. And then finally, a symptom that I think many of us refer to as one that seems to be quite characteristic of idiopathic hypersomnia, although there are some patients with narcolepsy who also describe it, which is sleep inertia. This is where I just feel as though that I cannot wake up no matter how hard I try. The alarm goes off, it takes me a million snoozes, and despite that, it's still a challenge. And in its extreme form, sleep inertia can also be referred to as sleep drunkenness, where it's very appropriately termed because it almost looks like a person is intoxicated, being discoordinated, combative, not making any sense. And so these symptoms very much can be extraordinarily impactful. The other piece I would just point out is that it's probably not by accident that these four representations are by women. This is a disorder that we very frequently see occurring in females far more than we are in men. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, most of our narcolepsy patients can boom, wake up, and then quickly get sleepy again, whereas these folks, the sleep inertia is terrible. And then the desire to nap. I mean, they, they take long naps, and they still have sleep inertia after the naps. And then some of them are long sleepers. They'll, they'll say, gosh, I sleep 10 hours, 11, 12 hours a day. Um, there are a lot of sleepy people out there, and this is still a relatively rare disorder and there was a recent publication about that. Would you comment on that? Sure. So I think one of the biggest challenges when you're talking about central disorders of hypersomnolence is we still have a hard time nailing down 
how prevalent actually are these disorders? Some of the challenges that are unique to idiopathic hypersomnia is that since their initial characterization in the 1950s, it's changed its terms over time. So we're trying to figure out how can we actually make an estimation of how prevalent this disorder is. Very frequently in these types of situations, we rely on medical claims data, so our insurance billing, in order to say, what do we see in terms of trends of people identifying and diagnosing? When we look at this recent study, it looked at uh, medical claims data between 2019 and 2021. And we are actually identifying that this is a disorder that is occurring at somewhere between 30 and 40 um, uh, of 100,000 people. And what we're seeing is year after year, we're actually seeing an increase in the number being diagnosed. Yeah, that certainly is is true. I would, would love to know what the prevalence is, and um, my own impression is that it's probably a lot more than what we're we're measuring based on some of this claims data. But it's, the, it's currently the best that we have. Um, so this trend is very interesting. But we're also we know patients with narcolepsy, for example, have significant increase in comorbidities. What about IH? So similarly, because of the fact that we're still struggling with understanding who these patients are and what does their experience look like, again, frequently we may reference the medical claims data. That doesn't necessarily give us causation, but it gives us correlation. It helps us frame out a potential clinical picture to allow for us to have future investigations to be able to confirm what this relationship is. However, with the claims data, what we are seeing is that there's an increased prevalence of comorbidity in individuals affected with idiopathic hypersomnia. As we've already referenced, we are seeing that this is more highly prevalent in women, affecting somewhere around 65% based on the claims data. However, we're also seeing that it's not IH alone that these individuals are experiencing. It's not uncommon for them to experience pain syndromes like headache and migraine disorder, uh, psychiatric comorbidities like mood disorder, also other sleep disorders like obstructive sleep apnea, and finally increased risk for cardiovascular disease. When we look at these claims data and the prevalence of comorbidities, it is so informative to us as a medical community of how we may actually fulfill a role in better understanding the epidemiology. Why? Because when we have those patients who have obstructive sleep apnea and persistent EDS, we may want to think twice about this. When we may be our cardiologists or primary care physicians who are seeing patients with cardiovascular disease and sleepiness or headache and sleepiness, we may want, again, think about what else may be at play and how may we actually be able to appropriately diagnose and optimize your therapeutic interventions for these individuals. Yeah, I personally think these are fascinating patients. And as you said, more prevalent in females. And a lot of my patients tell me, gosh, I feel drugged uh, all day long. It feels yes. like I took a sleeping pill in the daytime. But, uh, but we've talked about prevalence, but this pervasive sleepiness and parenthetically, I would encourage people to look at the registry trials because you, you sort of see the impact of um, who's being studied, what the distribution is, as you pointed out earlier. So I think that registry data, is, uh, the registry trial is really is important. But we talked about prevalence. Uh, what does the sleepiness do to the quality of life in these individuals? So an important take home point that I think individuals who may be listening to the CME is the fact that we are typically medical professionals participating. And in order to illustrate how this is so burdensome, I generally tell people to think about when they were in training and maybe they were in residency or fellowship having long stretches of nights without sleeping. Yeah. Those following days, that experience of feeling like I'm not thinking clearly, I'm extraordinarily exhausted. You weren't necessarily lapsing into sleep, but you were struggling to live a quality filled wakefulness. This is what an individual with idiopathic hypersomnia experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we look at studies like the ARISE study, we see that this is exactly what we're hearing from patients. They're having impaired quality of life, which is reflecting both that their social life is compromised, as well as the stigma around, I look lazy or I'm not trying hard enough. And there's that stigma that is reducing that quality of life. There's definitely more severe cognitive complaints, more severe depression, and also a decrease in the ability to be present in things that they want to be. This presenteeism affects their work experience, but also their social life. They're physically at a birthday party or a, a joyful event, but they mentally and emotionally are unable to be there. Finally, when we look at when we talk to families as well as individuals with idiopathic hypersomnia, it's not shocking to see that near 100% of them describe the fact that 
This disorder is stealing quality of life from them on a day-to-day -day basis. Although also the majority had underestimated how much it actually was going to negatively impact them. You know, Anne-Marie, you talk about quality of life issues and I'm reminded, um, I have a young mom who is really struggling. I mean, her self-esteem is so poor. She falls asleep when she goes to pick up her kids at school. She takes a nap when her kids take a nap and then she still wants to nap later on in the day. And she's, she's really worried because she feels I'm not there for my children. And I'm, I'm a terrible mom because all I want to do is sleep all the time. I could sleep 12 hours a day. Have you seen something similar to that? I can definitely identify with the symptoms that you're describing in the patient population who I've taken care of. There is a tremendous obstacle of not just treating the sleepiness, but also the self-acceptance that this is a disorder that is causing this for you to experience, not that it's a lack of you doing something right. to be a better person. And, and that very frequently makes me question also, is that some of what we're seeing when we see the signal of increased mood disorder, depression, anxiety, is because very frequently these are individuals who are trying with all their might to be awake. But even when they're awake, they're so distracted by the desire to go to sleep that they just physically are not present in an emotional or cognitive context. And it's been interesting because I've had patients before the diagnosis, but I'm seeing them for an initial encounter. And the primary thing that I'm thinking is, is this is idiopathic hypersomnia. And I ask the question frequently, what do you think is going on? What do you think is, is the problem? And it's not uncommon that the response is, well, I just don't think I'm trying hard enough, or maybe if I just organize myself better. And when you describe that, you think that there's actually something medical that's driving this. There is this sigh of relief. And very frequently, I've even encountered tears that acknowledge the struggle that they've been experiencing. Yeah. I thought I, I, thought I was just lazy. And, uh, and uh, you know, another quick example is the husband is like, I'm so tired. I can't wake her up in the morning. And get the kids ready. And so there's this family interaction that we see all the time. But uh, thank you very much. You know, I'm impressed by them, as you said, the self-esteem. I mean, so many of these folks have had it for a long time undiagnosed, and they they really think that something's wrong with them from a personality perspective. And self-esteem is really a big problem. And Marie, this is this has been phenomenal. Thank you very much. I learned some things. So I hope the audience learned a lot today. So let's summarize with our SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. That is what we really hope that our audience will take from this presentation and apply to your practice. We want you to identify patients' specific language in the patient visits that indicates idiopathic hypersomnia as a possible diagnosis. Recognize the prevalence of both idiopathic hypersomnia and its associated comorbidities and the importance of its increasing frequency. Screen for idiopathic hypersomnia, specific quality of life burdens when meeting with patients and their families. So this CMEO snack is one of a four-part series. We hope that you'll take advantage of all of the short and focused activities in the series. So thank you very much for Dr. Anne-Marie Morris for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, for participating and providing the best care for your patients.